Hi everyone, welcome to the State Machine Hackathon webinar. My name is Jenny and today we have David. We are from Stately and we're going to go over what a state machine is and prepare you for the hackathon on Saturday in Orlando. Yeah, that's right. So um, like Jenny said, this hackathon is for um, uh, people in Orlando, but we're going to just be going over a lot of uh, state machine concepts and why you would use XState, where you could use XState. And we're also going to be building an example checkout app. Uh, so we're going to be starting with a simple example and then moving on towards there. Even if you're not attending the webinar and you're watching from far, far away, uh, away from Orlando, uh, hopefully, you know, you could participate in the chat and uh, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, we do have a chat box, so uh, we do see your questions. So please ask us questions at any time, and we're going to answer them on, on the screen. So, all right, let's get started. Uh, first of all, what is Stately? And in fact, I'm going to hide this little banner here. All right, so we are Stately. And so Stately is a, uh, Stately, it's a suite of visual tools that allows you to visualize and build your application logic. Um, and so in particular, we're focused on the t technology of state machines and state charts. This is what we're, um, you know, we're, what we're really passionate about. And so this might seem like a foreign concept to a lot of people, especially developers. Um, but honestly, it's a lot easier than you may think. Uh, so I guess I could get started by just explaining what a state machine is and furthermore, what a state chart is and just help you get a feel for it. And I feel the best way to do this is to actually uh, do it visually. So if you were to go to stately.ai slash editor, this link over here, um, you could start playing around with the visual editor uh, as far as uh, playing around and you know creating state machines, it's absolutely free to use. Uh, so this is actually what a state machine looks like and I could zoom in. It zoomed in a lot. Whoa. <laughs> Demonstrating the Canvas features over here. You could press space bar, move this over here. And when you go to stately.ai slash editor, um, this is what you come with. Uh, this is what you know comes up or something similar to this. This is your state machine. And currently our state machine has two states. We have new state one over here, event one and new state two. So, okay, what do these boxes and arrows mean? Well, the box over here and over here, these are called states. These are, for example, states that your app could be in. If you're doing a backend workflow, these are uh, steps in the workflow. So this might be a, state, a step running to completion. And then when it's done, you might be doing this step. So uh, the way that we, that we transition from one state to another is through a transition. So this line represents a transition and transitions are caused by events. So if I click here, we see that we go from new state one to new states two. And uh, you could model a lot of things in this way. Again, doing it um, in terms of workflows, uh, it, it, it makes sense, but um, sometimes it might be confusing to understand where you would use this in front end applications, for instance. Um, so that's why what we're going to be building today is a checkout app, just because a checkout flow is a common type of a state machine that, you know, you could build out. You know, there's a, a defined sequence of steps and the steps aren't always linear, which is, you know, what we're going to talk about as well. Uh, so where can you actually use this? I mean, for now, this actually seems like, you know, a a way to diagram these sorts of flows and you know you could create states like this um but so where does this actually you know become useful and so the way that this becomes useful is when you actually export it to code probably can't see it over here but uh you can see that right now we have three different ways of exporting this to code either through json JavaScript or TypeScript. And so this is meant right now to be used with the XState library. So XState is a library for creating these JavaScript state machines and state charts. And uh, it's been around for a while. Um, if you aren't familiar with XState, I highly encourage you to check it out. Um, there's a lot of uh, different templates that you could use. 
Um, but it, it's actually pretty easy to just get up and going, um, you know, just by downloading XState and using it in your application. So uh, let's, uh, let's do a small little example. When you click um, like this XState template, for instance, it's going to uh, open up a code sandbox. Yeah, so it's gonna open up a code sandbox file like this. And so you're gonna see a few things. The first thing you're going to see, and hopefully this is big enough. Should I make the font bigger? What do we think? If you can. Okay. All right, so the first thing that you're going to see is this create machine call. This is how you create your state machine. And so there's a bunch of things in here. Don't worry about that for now. The simplest state machine that you could create looks like that. It's just a simple object. There's nothing going on. You could think of this as a state machine with basically one single root state. So it, it doesn't really do anything special, but you know, there you go. That's your simplest state machine. Um, I'll leave that in there for now. Now, in order to take that state machine, which represents some sort of logic and actually make it live and um, you know, just doing stuff when you send it events, you have to interpret it. So that creates what's called an actor. An actor is something that you could send events to and it could receive events and do things with those events. Um, we could also listen to what happens when a state transition occurs within that actor using on transition. So in this case, I'm just console logging the state value and the state context, and then I'm sending it events by calling actor.send. Uh, to visualize this better, I actually created a, um, a more visual version of that. So again, this is a very simple state machine. I'm gonna reload so that we get that bigger font size. All right, so you can see that this is a state machine with a single state. We have this start state over here, Again, it's not doing anything special. And this button I've wired up to send the next event. So this is what an event looks like, or rather an event object. Uh, all event objects have a type property. And so we could send, for example, type next, and that's gonna send next to the state machine, but it, the, the value isn't handled over here. So. Let's actually make a little example. And because I don't feel like coding, even though I'm about to do a bunch of coding in a few minutes, I'm actually going to use the editor to, uh, to help me out. And what we're going to model is a traffic light because traffic lights are sort of like the hello world of state machines. So I'm just gonna call this green and I'm just double clicking in order to edit each of these. I'm gonna say this is next, hello. Gonna call this next. And this is gonna be red. Next. Okay, so here's our simple um, traffic light. By the way, if you um, if you're feeling lazy like me and you don't want to like manually make this pretty, there's this cool little auto layout button over here that um, tries to intelligently uh, find a good layout. Uh, most of the time it works every time. Um, but you could see that we're going from green to yellow to red back to green. When I click simulate up here, see this button right here, we enter simulation mode. And so that shows what the active state is. And when I click next, we see that we're in the yellow state. When I click next, we're in the red state. And now when I click next, we go back to the green state. So the only thing that can cause the transition is an event. So transitions just don't happen spontaneously. There always has to be a reason to transition from one state to another. Additionally, finite state machines have the property that only one state can be active at a time. So uh, you can't be in both the green and yellow or the green and red state at the same time. And honestly, this is for the best. I would hate to see a traffic light where you have multiple lights on at the same time, just because you might cause a few accidents. And so um, it's, it, it's the same thing with applications. And the, the point of this is to prevent impossible states. For example, if you're modeling loading some data, you're either loading the data or the data has loaded or you've failed to load the data. So you do want to model that as distinct states. 
And the simplest way to do that is with enums, like string enums, if you want, or you could go all out and model it as a state machine. Anyway, so that's enough of me blabbing. Let's actually get this to code. So I'm gonna click over here, this code, and I'm going to take the JavaScript variant and I'm just gonna copy that over. So let's bring that over here. I am going to replace this create machine call with what we've generated from the editor. So I'm just going to paste it in there. And don't worry about these things in the bottom. Uh, this is the uh, states and transitions that we've created. So again, I've wired up this button, button L, to send next. So when I click next, we're calling actor.send with that events type, type next. And so what's gonna happen is inside the interpreter, it's checking the current states and then it's evaluating what's the next date I should go to when I receive that next event. So in this case, it's going to be the yellow state. And when we click next, we see that it is the yellow state. Then we could send next again and we could just keep clicking and see that the states change. So, yeah. All right, so um, any questions on that? It's basically a very, very um, you know, brief introduction to, uh, to X state. All right, so Stefan says, it's a bit like a generator with yield. And yeah, so generators, coroutines, they're, they're sort of actually state machines. And if you're not familiar with a generator, a generator is sort of, uh, what's the best way to describe it? It's like a stateful function where you could yield, uh, you could yield values. And so it pauses execution at those values. Uh, and so with things like functions where you have, for example, like an async, oops, async, if I could type, async function, you might await something and then await something else. And then if, you know, something, then you await another thing. And so over here, what you're doing is you are creating a state machine, but you're creating it implicitly. So let's say that these are steps one, two, and three. Um, you're basically creating like this, one, two, three. But in order to loop back, since code is li uh, read linearly, you're reading it from top to bottom, it becomes a lot more awkward to do something like, hey, I wanna go back to this date, I wanna do this thing again. And so typically the way that you would do it is, um, oops, I forgot to name this, uh, let's call this a uh, routine. Um, the way that you would do that is having a, like a while true and then placing all that in there. And then, you know, just that that's going to loop again until you break it. Uh, so that was just an aside, just showing you the comparison between what async code looks like, um, what generator code looks like, even though I haven't written a generator in a while, but it looks a little similar with yield instead of async awaits uh, and what a state machine looks like. And so that's why with a state machine, you can have, for example, if we want to branch from this and like just go somewhere else, like let's say here, and now we've taken a different path, uh, we could do that as well. Um, another thing we could do is we could uh, branch given conditions. So let's say that we only want to allow this on some certain condition Otherwise, we want to stay at yellow. So what I could do is add a guard and just say, if allowed. Um, and I mean, this is no longer a valid <laughs> stoplight. I'm just showing you the different uh, possibilities here. But I could also just add another transition and we go you know, perhaps to a different state. Um, so a guarded transition it says, uh, all right, we're going to check this guard. So if it's allowed or not. And if that guard is true, then this transition is enabled. So we'll go to red. Otherwise, we check this transition. And then, uh, so you could see how you could do branching logic like that. And we'll see more, um, you know, more examples of this pretty soon. So I'm just going to delete this guard and uh, check in the comments real quick. Stefan, again, you can chat GPT, write you a JavaScript generator for sure. 
here's the funny thing. Um, and actually, I want to uh, show this. Um, you could also use ChatGPT to um, you could use ChatGPT to generate steam machines as well. So, uh, but actually, you know what? I'm not going to do that right now. It's probably for a different video. Anyway, okay. So we've we've seen how to create a basic traffic light state machine. So now let's actually do something a little bit more real world. Uh, and we'll try to get through most of this, you know, within an hour or so, uh, see how much we could get covered. Um, but uh, I will share the source code for this later too. Okay, so what are we building? I want to build a shopping cart. And this is just a, an application where we have a cart and then we transition from the cart when we click checkout securely to some screen where we could have a shipping address and the user could select one of their shipping addresses. And then we transition to a contact information screen where the user could enter their contact information details. And then we transition to a payment screen. And then once everything is good and they click place their order, it transitions to a confirmation screen. So this is the thing we're gonna be building. A lot of you might know this as a multi-step form or a wizard form. Uh, so yeah, we see all the steps over here. And what we're going to be building out is this checkout machine. Now, let me refresh this so we have the biggest font size. Okay, here we go. So right now our machine is empty. There's nothing going on in here. Lots of room to play around with. Uh, and in fact, we'll even have the editor help us out a little bit. Okay, so um, yeah, let's, let's actually figure this out. And also, if you're not using React, don't worry. A lot of what we're gonna be talking about is not React specific. Uh, so most of it is just going to be related to the state machine. There's integrations for Vue, um, for uh, other frameworks as well. I think we have Svelte, Solid is coming up soon. Um, yeah, we have a lot of things coming up. So, uh, all right, let's build out our checkout machine and just figure out what do we want the flow of this to look like. So I'm gonna go back in here and let's call this checkout machine. And uh, okay, so let's start. First of all, we want a cart. This is going to be our shopping cart page where we see all of the items listed. And um, let me go ahead and hide this, zoom in over here. All right, so we have our cart. And so when the user clicks checkout, we want to go to some sort of payment screen. So let me actually delete a bunch of these, start fresh. Okay, so when the user clicks checkout, and we want to go to some sort of payment screen. Um, and so this is um, just a, a way that you could sort of communicate with your entire team and describe, okay, I have an idea for how the flow of our logic is supposed to be. You don't need to work out any of the details or um, add any code yet. You could just, you're literally creating a flow chart and you know, you're talking through it with your team and making sure that the flow is correct. So from the payment page, uh, let's say you decide, okay, we're going to go from payments to, um, actually, just kidding. We're going to shipping. <laughs> we need our shipping information first before we get to payments. All right. So after we have our shipping information, uh, let's say that they fill it out and then um, they click next. Then we go to the contact information page. And so they could do a few things in here, like enter their email address, uh, enter their mobile phone number, and then they're going to click next again. So when they click next, then we go to payment screen. And so in this payment screen, they could do a few more things as well. They could select their payment method. They could, they have to click agree, and then they have to actually click order in order to place their order. So right now, what we're going to do is uh, when they click order, it's just going to go to that confirmation screen. And also, one way of marking that uh, this flow is done and you've reached the final state is by setting that state to type final. And so you could see it with this you know, double bordered box. 
that is what indicates a final state. So this is a very, very simple flow. Um, but, you know, as, as with all things in programming, things don't usually stay simple. So we can simulate this and just talk through it as a user. So we're in the cart page, we check out, we enter shipping information, click next, enter contact information, click next, enter payment information, click order, and now we're in the confirmation step. But here's where it gets interesting, and this is what I was talking about, where not all workflows are as simple and linear as this one. Um, let's say that we wanted to offer the option for quickly paying via a payment service like PayPal. So we could do that by saying, hey, if we're on the cart page and they want to check out via PayPal, let's just go directly, oops, I went to the wrong place, uh, directly from the cart to the payments page. And so now we could see that the modified flow is that you could click PayPal and then it takes you directly to the payment page. Um, and so this is something, again, you could talk through with your team. And so they might say, hey, uh, when we're on the payment page, what if they change their mind and they don't want to use um, PayPal? So you could just drag and say, I don't know, never mind, or something like that. Just create an event that goes back to the cards. And now you could see that your flow is becoming more fleshed out. You know, we're seeing more details. We're covering more use cases. Um, but for now, we're going to keep it simple like this. Okay, so we know that this flow works. And also the visual editor will tell you if uh, something is wrong. So let's say that we switch the order of this and this is deleted. Now we're gonna get little question marks. And so these question marks are really helpful because it tells you, for instance, that this is an unreachable state, meaning that starting from the initial state, there's no possible way that we could get to the payment state. And same for this confirmation state, we see that it's an unreachable state. And so if we make a few fixes, like adding next back here and switching the order here, we see that those warnings disappear. Okay, so we've diagrammed our checkout machine and let me take a break and answer a few questions. Um, Daniel asks, any plans for Angular integration? Uh, yeah, that's a really good idea. And we do have an ongoing discussion in GitHub discussions about that. A lot of people are actually using X8 with Angular. And the funny thing is that when you interpret a machine, that actor is already observable. So you could call subscribe, you could uh, use it just like you can with any other observable. So X8 actually works pretty naturally with Angular as is. Now, with that said, we would like to provide helpers and uh, maybe different operators to help uh, work with those, I guess, actor subscriptions or actor observables, whatever you want to call them. Um, but uh, yeah, so we yeah we do want to um, have Angular integration as a first class thing though, for sure. Uh, Hugo asks, is this being recorded? I believe so, I hope so. Yes, this is uh, being recorded right now, but also if you wanted to explore more into state machines and uh, our stately studio. We do have a YouTube. It's youtube.com slash stately AI, where you can check out more videos and tutorials. That's right. Yep. And I just double check. So yes, this is being recorded and the recording is going to be available to you after the session. So uh, if you need to go get some water, have some food. Um, if you're in that state of hunger or tiredness, don't worry. This video will... <laughs> Uh, you know, will make its way over to you. All right, so awesome. We have our state machine, just a nice, simple state machine. Check out, you know, contact, payment. Um, there's actually a few more things that we need to do though. So uh, there's a thing called a self-transition. And so it, it sounds complicated. It's really not. A self-transition is just an event that does something but it doesn't change states. And so this is really good when you're communicating that when you're in this state, these are the types of things that can happen, whether it's initiated by a user, some outside entity, whatever, or even in events that the machine sends itself. So for example, in the carts, I'm just gonna right click and click add self transition. 
we could you know, enter a VIP code. So this might be a special code, like a promo code or something like that. We could also check out and we could also you know, go to PayPal. So um, another thing we could do in the shipping state, uh, let's add a few self transitions here. We could select a shipping address. So we can imagine that we're showing the user a list of shipping addresses that they might have saved. And as an exercise to the reader, you could create a form that makes a new shipping address. And um, the user will also be able to select a shipping method. So again, I'm not writing any code. I'm just writing what the user can do. And I'm, I'm using uppercase just you know, as a stylistic preference. You could definitely type it as select shipping method or just whatever. So I'm just going to change it back to what it was. Uh, then we go next here. All right. And so also on the contact, there's a few things we could do. We could enter email and we could enter mobile for your mobile phone. So I'll just move these over here. Um, also for the payments, they have to do a few things. So first they have to select the payment method. And again, when they do these, or when these self events occur, the state isn't changing. We're just doing something. And we're going to add that doing something in a minute. Um, and also, they have to agree to something. So agree to the terms and conditions. So I'm just going to type agree for that over there. And then we have order. And order takes us to confirmation. So these are all of our states and transitions. Hopefully, auto layout does the right thing. OK, it, it works somewhat decently. But let's go over this again. When, wow, it's big. Whoa. I just got a new mouse. So <laughs> uh, in our cart, we could do a few things. We could enter a VIP code. We could check out. We could go to PayPal. So let's just check out over here. In shipping, we could select a shipping method, select a shipping address. And then we go to the next. And then we can enter our mobile information, enter the email, go next, select a payment method, click agree, and then go back to order. And then we could confirm. Now, of course, if you want to model like, hey, we should let the user go back, um, of course, you could do that by just adding events like that. You'd say, OK, in this flow, you could go back like that. Um, again, that's an exercise for the reader. And the reason, by the way, that you might want to do this instead of relying on browser navigation is because, for example, when you, um, let's say you're on the confirmation page, you've already made your order and you click back. You shouldn't be taken to the payment page because you've already made the order. Like going back here is just going to really mess things up. So you want some sort of logic to handle what if the user clicks back on the confirmation page. And so that's why, um, that's why back may be tricky, and it's something that you have to think about. Uh, but state machines are really good at helping you think about these kinds of things. OK, so we diagrammed our state machine, and we already know that we could just export that to code. Uh, so I'm, in fact, I'm going to grab the TypeScript version because I have all my events and stuff. So uh, I'm just going to copy this over, and we are going to go back to our checkout machine. and. I'm going to paste that all in there. <clears throat> OK, awesome. So uh, ignore these errors. I just forgot a key property. Um, all right, so just checking out the questions real quick. Uh, <laughs> we are building a Shopify influencer shop. Yeah, you can think of that. You know, we're <laughs> We are building a Shopify clone. Actually, a lot of this is influenced from uh, the Lego.com checkout flow, which, by the way, is built with XState if you want to see a real world example. So, um, and I, I go on the checkout flow all the time because, as you can see, I, I like Legos a lot. <laughs> all right. So, um, let's see. Going back to our checkout machine, we have our machine. It's not really doing much of anything so far. So, I can delete this real quick. Okay. Um, so we have this hook over here. And again, this is React specific. It's going to look a little bit different depending on the framework you use. But 
what use interpret does under the hood is it's going to create that actor that we talked about using interpret and checkout machine. So let's actually console.log that um, I'll get snapshot and see what that looks like. So I know you can't see you know, that, so I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. And we have our state. There's a lot of things going on here, but there's only a few things that you, know, you should be worried about. The first one is this value over here. It says value cart. And so that tells you what state you're currently on. Um, for normal state machines, it's a string, but once you have nested states and parallel states, which we'll say for another webinar, then it becomes an object because you could rep represent more complex uh, state values. Uh, there's also context over here in, and right now it's empty, uh, but that is where you store all of your extra data. So in this case, we're gonna be storing our form data in that context object. Um, there's also some helper functions like matches and can, and we're gonna be taking a look at those. Everything else you don't really need to worry about at least uh, not right now and not for this kind of application. So that's what's going on there. And use interpret is subscribing to the actor or actually it's not subscribing to the actor. There's hooks to do that, um, but it provides this actor and it also starts it. So the actor isn't running until it's started. Um, so you, you could think of it as like a machine that you have to press the power button in order for it to actually start working and start being able to receive events. So that's what's happening under the hood. Let's delete that. And so we know that we have that value from our state. So in React, the way that we grab that value is using a selector. If you come from Redux land, this is gonna feel really familiar. So we're just gonna say const state value. Uh, yeah, state value, um, oops, equals u selector. And so our first argument is gonna be that actor. And then we're gonna grab that state value. So we're just going to pass it a function that says, here's the thing that I want passed in. Okay, so now just to test this out, I'm going to um, make a heading. I'm using chocolate, by the way. So let's just make it 3XL. Uh, this would be your H1 if you're not using um, chakra or anything like that. And I want to log out that state value. Okay, so you can see really big over here, our current value is cart. So what I could do, because I know that this value is going to change as we transition, transition through the state machine, um, I could conditionally show this cart view. So I could say if state value is cart, show that cart component. And so because it is, you know, it, it's going to show that. So we're going to do the same thing for the others. So state value equals shipping. Uh, state value is contact. State value is payment and state value how many equal signs confirmation okay so now because we know you know according to the laws of state machines that we could only be in one state at a time we're only going to see one screen at a time so i'm going to go ahead and save this and now you could see that the only thing that we see is my cart now, this actor, uh, it has a few methods on it. One of the most important ones is that send. So you could call actor.send, and so that's going to send an event uh, to that actor. Um, but before we get into that, just going to answer a question real quick. What is the difference between use machine and use interpret? So it's a great question. It's a React-specific question, um, or an X8 React-specific question. Uh, with use interpret, we're not subscribing to the state. And so this is actually very good for performance because you could use selector and only get the data that you need. And so what this means is that this app is not going to re-render unless this state value changes. However, if we didn't do this, and let's say that we had const state 
send equals use machine checkout machine, then what's going to happen is that this, we're going to always get the latest dates, but this component is going to re-render every single time the state changes. And sometimes it's useful. You know, sometimes it's really convenient, but sometimes it's not what you want. So you want to avoid extra re-renders. And so that's why we have this use interpret, which only returns the actor and not the state. So how do you get the state? Use selector. So hopefully that answered that question. All right. Um, I also just realized that we are blocking this. So I'm going to just move us to the side over there. Hey, Jenny. <laughs> All right. So um, yeah, let, let's, um, let's get moving. And again, feel free to ask any questions. It's what a webinar is for. All right. So how do we transition from the cart to the shipping uh, state? So that's why I actually passed that actor. And so like I was talking about, we have that actor.send method, and that's how you send events over to the actor. So um, in order to demonstrate that, I'm going to use my favorite hook, which is uh, use effect, of course. Not really my favorite. Um, but And just to demonstrate, we are going to set timeout. And, uh, and again, this is just a demonstration. But we are going to call actor.send. And we're going to send now, thankfully, because of the TypeScript export, we get all of these uh, nicely typed events. So I could just choose one and let's choose checkout. And we're going to send that after two, uh, 2,000 milliseconds or two seconds. And uh, let's see what happens. So I save that. It's going to send that event. And now we go to the shipping page. If you missed it, there it is again. After two seconds, it goes to the shipping page. And so because we have that method available on that actor object, uh, all I have to do is pass it into these components. And so there, uh, in React, there's a couple ways you could do that. You could either pass it in directly as props or use context. Again, context is an exercise to the reader. You would just create a context and pass in that actor, which is an object that you could send events to and subscribe to. And um, yeah, just make it available in those components. So if we dive into carts, show you what we're dealing with over here. <clears throat> we have this use actor hook, which uh, is reading that actor that we have. <clears throat> and we're reading the state and the send event from it. Just like use reducer, it's pretty much the same signature or the same return value. And so that state is going to give us uh, pretty much everything in that machine state. And then we could send events to it. Uh, so we could see down here that we have events like uh, we're sending enter VIP code here, and we're also sending type checkout right over here. So we know that when we click this button, it's going to send that checkout event, and we're going to transition to the next date. So again, as a refresher, we're over here, and this is hooked up to that button, and we're going to go to the shipping state. So um, if we click here, we see indeed we are at that shipping state. Now um, let's talk about like, how do we actually add values to um, context? But before we get into that, I'm um, gonna answer a few more questions. questions. Yes. All right, so from Hugo, why would we use machine over use interpret and use selector since you have more granular control? Um, and honestly, it's a matter of convenience. So uh, for example, if you're used to use states or use reducer in React, uh, then use machine is going to be your equivalent to use reducer. And so now if you've been using use reducer in React, you might be questioning like, you know, we don't really have granular control in our components when we have use reducer. It's just going to re-render whenever that reducer value changes, which is absolutely right. And React doesn't really provide a another hook to help you control that. Um, so that's why if you just want to prototype some code real quick, you want all the values maybe to log and see that things are transitioning correctly, and you want to see all of that state all of the time, use machine is the way to go. And also the equivalent over here, when you already have an actor, 
use actor is going to give you that state and send. So basically, if you're feeling lazy or like me and you want to just see values um, as they change, then just use actor. And in fact, that's where I would start. Either use actor or use machine to see what you're working with. And once you know, okay, I have the correct states, I have the correct data, then you could um, fine tune performance with use interpret and use selector. So um, Shafan says, so with interpret, you get service.send and service, but not states. With use machine, you get all three. So yes, again, uh, you could use selector to grab that states and, um, but uh, yeah, so it's just two hooks instead of one. All right, so um, moving on, I am using actor or sorry, using the use actor hook to grab the state again whenever it changes, and we could fine tune that later. Um, and so yeah, we have this event over here, enter VIP code, and we want to store it in context somehow. So here's how we do that. Uh, let's go to our carts page. And again, we have enter VIP code, which isn't doing much of anything. So um, what we're going to do is, since this has no target, it's not going to transition to another state, we're going to add an action. So this action, um, we want to assign to context. And context is down here. I'm going to move it up here just to make things a little bit more clear. Um, but we actually want to you know, fill this with some value. So I'm going to add a VIP code. And uh, right now this is gonna be null, meaning we have no VIP code. So how do we actually populate that? Well, we use the assign action. So I'm gonna bring assign into here. And then we're going to say VIP code. And this is a function that takes, or that you're, you're given two arguments, the context, which is the current context, and the events that caused this transition to happen. And so in this case, we could just um, let's take a look at how it's being called. So it's just coming in via value. So we could say that we're assigning event.value over to that VIP code. Ignore the red squigglies for now. We'll talk about typing maybe if we have time later. Um, so yeah, uh, and actually let's make sure that this works. So we have the VIP code and um, we want to make sure that while we're changing the VIP code, it is actually updating in the machine. So I'm going to add a, let's just do a strong tag, VIP code. And this is going to be our state.context.vip code. So right now there's no VIP code, but um, give, See, doing something wrong. Let's make sure. I might need to reload my machine because it should work. Yeah. Okay, I just need it to reload. So give me this for free. Let's say that that's a VIP code. Uh, and so we could see that that is actually working and it is storing it to the machine context. So again, if we were to uh, log that, um, and we can log it directly in the cart. So console.log states.context. We could see that in our context, we have this VIP code. Give me this for free. So um, yeah, that's how you could actually assign data. All right, so um, taking a look at the questions. Ilan Fox says, wouldn't it be better to be decoupled from the machine internal state and only listen to the context? Yeah, so it depends on your application logic, whether you're listening for those explicit states or you're listening for um, how the context is changing. But yes, you could definitely do that. So for instance, if this cart page, I don't care about anything else except, well, in this case, you know what? I don't care about anything else except this VIP code. So let's actually take your suggestion to heart and refactor this a little bit. So we could say const VIP code equals use selector, check out actor. And like you said, I only care about state, oops, state.context. 
uh, the IP code. And so I could actually get rid of this. We're going to have a few more red squigglies. And, um, you know, now we don't need these anymore. I could just get rid of that. Get rid of this one. And so now this becomes, this is the same thing as checkout actor dot send. So let's make sure that this works exactly the same. We still have, ooh, send is, oh, forgot one over there. So checkout actor dot send. We still have our VIP code right here. And I could click checkout securely and it's going to transition to the next date. So um, yeah, being decoupled, yeah, always a good thing to do. Another question, can I make a transition based on a value in the state? So uh, if I bookmarked, exited a certain state and it was persisted in local storage and I load that into context. So if I bookmark, exited a certain state, persisted and loaded it into context. Uh, yeah, so that's a little bit more of an advanced topic or at least one that we don't necessarily have uh, time for right now, but you could persist the state and restore it just by uh, you know just passing it in here. So. Uh, so that's that's one way of doing it. Um, if you're using use machine, then you could do the same thing. Um, yeah, so you could definitely persist the state and restore it at a certain point. Hugo asks, could we use the second parameter of spawn uh, to sync the input field states to the form context? Sorry if I'm confusing things over here. Um, the second parameter of spawn, we're not using spawn anywhere, so if you could clarify that, that'd be awesome. Um, yeah, but uh, until then, we'll we'll just move on for now. Uh, okay, so more things to talk about. Um, okay, so we're on our shipping, and uh, you know we have select shipping address and select shipping method. So um, over here, the way that I program these is that each one of these is an ID. So we're going to be doing the same thing where uh, when, so actions. So uh, when we have the select shipping address event, that is going to come from the event and we get that ID and then we assign that ID to the shipping address. And so we could do the same thing over here. And so this instead is now shipping method. And again, we have an ID over there. And um, also this is a, uh, yeah, th so th this is a good um, thing that someone else brought up, which is decoupling that, um, or sorry, um, just separation of concerns where uh, we don't care about the state, but instead we care about, um, you know, if some certain data is present. And so just to show you what I'm talking about, we have a section over here, uh, Let's see, where is it? Oh, yeah, over here. So we're hiding a box where it's just like, if we don't have a shipping address, then uh, we, we don't want to show that box. Because obviously, depending on the shipping address, you might want to conditionally show uh, different shipping methods. So we're just doing that over here. We're saying if there is no shipping address, we're going to keep this box hidden. Um, OK, so let's actually go through that. So we're going to click checkout securely, select shipping address. I need to reload again, just to make sure that that's coming through, select an address. Okay. So you selected an address and now you see that there is a shipping method. So, um, yeah. And then this is going to, you know, change that shipping method as well. Uh, there is one problem though. And so the problem is right now, when we go over here, um, or actually that button isn't even going to show, but it is possible to continue to contact information without selecting a shipping method. And so obviously we don't want to allow that to happen. So um, let's go ahead and fix this. Um, so right now we're just allowing, hey, we could go right to contact when you click the next button, which is obviously not what we want. So instead we want to make this a conditional transition. So we're going to say cond, 
And again, just like um, you know, these assignments, we have the same context and event. And we could say only allow this transition to happen if this function evaluates to true. So in this case, we want to make sure that we have a, uh, a valid shipping address. So return context.shipping address and that we have a valid shipping method. All right, so now we click checkout securely. Let's select the shipping address, but not select the shipping method. Um, I keep forgetting I have to refresh. Select the shipping address, select the shipping method. And I mean, that will work because I actually <laughs> accidentally clicked that. But now when I click continue to contact information, it's not going to go through. So now I'm going to show you another trick. This button represents the next event. And so what we want to do is we want to disable that button if the user isn't allowed to go on. So how do we do that? Traditionally, you would have to just copy this logic like, hey, um, we don't have a shipping address and we don't have a shipping method. Uh, so if that, neither of those are available, then disable the button. But with X8, there's a much, much easier way. So I'm gonna go down to here. <coughs> Sorry, water break. And um, this is a chocolate specific thing in normal React with a normal button, you would use disabled. But uh, I want to disable this button if we can't send the next event. And so because we have the state over here, all we have to do is say, if we can't send the next event, then disable it. And there you go. So now it's disabled until it actually becomes a valid transition. So again, I have to re, uh, reload it. We see it's disabled. And now when we click Express Saver, um, it's not letting me. So let me just make sure that my logic is correct. Uh, so context shipping address and context shipping method. Oh, you know what? Um, I just saved myself a lot of time because we want to make sure <laughs> that they're not undefined. So the problem was I was using index zero. And so, yeah, or maybe not. All right, so let's just make this example simple, debug that later. Let's um, say, hey, if we don't have a shipping method, then you can't go on. So now we have a shipping method, interesting. All right, well, anyway, um, disabled if we can't do type next. I promise you that is supposed to work, but we'll, we'll see an example uh, later. So anyway, let me answer some questions. Another one, is there a best practice for using state value equals something or state dot matches something? Um, okay, so Typically what you want to do, if you're trying to match the exact states in your state machine, uh, you want to use states.matches and then that value. So in this case, um, if we go back to the app, this should really be, um, so let, let's actually change this real quick because uh, I, I was just showing this for example purposes, but you do want to use state.matches in this case. So state.matches in each of these. And uh, we're going to basically get the same thing unless I have an error somewhere. Here we go. So now you're, you're going to see that we have the same thing. Um, however, I wouldn't fully rely on this just because this is getting a little bit into the implementation details of your machine. And if you do something like um, rename a state or move a state into a child state, or just, just rearrange the states in any way, not visually, but just like parents-child relationships and all of that, then it might not be as robust. And so a different way that you could do that, um, if you wanted to, and again, this is a refactor target, it's not something that you should start with, uh, is for example, let's say I give this a tag part. 
And so this could be an array, so you could give it multiple tags. But now, no matter what I name this date, so if I name this date, you know, something else, then it's still going to have that carts tag. So if I go over here and instead say state that has tag carts, then reload, we're still going to see the carts. So that's one technique you could use. Um, but yeah. All right. Uh, here's another great question. Uh, Mortiza asks, we can use from microstate management like Zustan, Jotai, instead of xState and similarity all of state machine with them, why xState? So that's a really good question. Um, with, uh, with other libraries like Zustan, Jotai, Redux, which by the way, work with xStates too, if you wanted to you know, use both, um, you can make a state machine, but that's... Uh, you know, that's sort of like saying you can grow your own farm and, you know, make your own vegetables and prepare your own meals instead of having something that's, you know, uh, <laughs> the, the right, you know, I guess, ingredients for it. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that X8 enforces the creation of a state machine and it facilitates the creation of it too, where you have a very standard way of not only creating a state machine, but visualizing it as well. And so just to give you an example, you could think of this, by the way, as a fancy reducer or a fancy Zustan store or something like this. Um, in fact, you don't even need states. You could just put transitions directly on the root machine. So I could say on, you know, add to cart. And then I could do my, um, you know, like I could make an assign action here. And then this basically becomes the same as Zustan in terms of functionality. Where it gets really powerful is in a couple of areas. Um, the first area is uh, in effects. So um, we talked about this briefly with the sign, but with state machines, you can model effects as well. And so there's three different types of effects, or actually they're, they're all pretty much the same. Uh, it's just a difference in where you put them. So for example, in carts, uh, I could add an effect. So I'm just going to add an entry action. I'm just going to call this do something. And so whenever I enter the states, this action is going to be executed. Um, similarly, you could have an exit action. And so this is a fire and forget action that's called whenever you exit the states. Um, and also you could have actions on transitions. So Um, and so state machines allow you to declaratively manage these actions, uh, which is the word we use for effects. Um, and so obviously when you're trying to model something in, you know, a, just a normal reducer, you can't really model effects in there. Um, and so these could be fire and forget effects, or they could be long lived effects. So, uh, I could, for example, call this fetch chipping data. And so now I have an effect that can communicate back with the machine and say, hey, I've received this uh, shipping data. Here you go. Um, and now you could work with it. And so, um, yeah, so that's one example where state machines are really good at just managing these effects and orchestrating when exactly they occur, um, which is something that state management libraries typically are not responsible for. They're just responsible for being a plain, unopinionated state container and managing effects is completely up to you. Instead, X state and st the concept of state machines and state charts in general, just uh, treat that as a first class citizen. The second thing, which you've been looking at this entire time, is visualization, both in the creation aspect and the inspection aspect. So I'm gonna show you. Um, little demo of that. I'm going to add the xState inspect package and I'm going to bring it into here. So import inspect from xState inspect. And I'm going to open this in a separate window because that's the easiest. And so now uh, when we go to use interpret, open that. Um, I'm going to set that tools to true. And so what this is going to do is it's going to inspect this machine as it's running in a separate window. So 
just do that. Uh, again, I might need a reload. So let's try this again. And there we go. So this is an older visualizer, um, but it's the, the current one for uh, inspecting machines. And so this is actually really cool because this visualizer shows you your exact machine, um, but it doesn't just show you the visualization of the machine. We've already seen that with the editor. It shows it to you as you're running it. So let's say that we click checkout securely. We see that we're in the shipping address and the visualizer will show you that you're also in that shipping address as well. So you could track which state you're in and also all of the things that you could do. Now, of course, there's Redux dev tools and things like that, which show you here are all of your past dates and here's your current state. The biggest difference between programming without state machines and programming with explicit state machines is that you could know what will happen next. So we can know these are the events that will happen or that can happen next. And these are all of my future states uh, that I could eventually get to. And um, so, yeah, if I were to reload this, I want to show you something else. What's really cool is that you could actually control the machine from here. So if I click checkout, it takes me to the shipping state, which is the state that I'm in over here. So frankly, these kinds of things and these visualizations and the ability, ability to in inspect machines in real time is not possible with just a plain state container. You need to be able to understand the definition of the machine interpret that, send it off to an inspector. Um, and so that's, you know, the, that's the, basically the premise of what X8 is built on. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> uh, Pico asks, there was a talk of implementing computer derived properties a while back. Have those landed yet? We're, um, you know, that's still under debate. Uh, we're trying to determine, is that a user land thing? Is that something that should be baked into the state machine? Um, yeah, so we're, we're still talking about that. Uh, Morteza asks, I saw your previous stream about command K and using X state for that, uh, with just one state. And I don't get a clear reason for that. Can you explain more about that? Uh, yeah. So, um, just real quick, uh, we, we did the stream previously, me and Farsad, where we were creating a command palette. And, uh, to start with, we just created a bunch of, um, a bunch of events or transitions on a single state. And again, the main reason for that is because those events would not necessarily, um, I mean, there's many things you could do with them, but they don't necessarily just assign data. There's other actions that may happen. Also in the future, it's actually really easy to go from having a single state to having multiple states where we might want to model a command palette being disabled or a command palette loading, or a command palette being closed or opened. And so those things, it makes sense to have finite states for. And so you could just move those events around and say, these kinds of events are only enabled in this state, um, or these kinds of events are enabled regardless of which state you're in. Um, so that would be the reason where, you know, starting with a single state is good. And then you could just refactor and move on to adding multiple states. All right, Stefan asks, is there a way to have a condition in a transition action to change the target state? So let's say that you have an order greater than $800 in the cart uh, that got to state X. If you leave the previous state, if it is below, you got to state Y. Um, if you leave the previous state, I'm not I'm trying to understand the if you leave the previous state part, but I'll show you real quick, like just a conditional transition again. Um, Okay, so if we go into our checkout machine, and so let's say that we only want to go to the shipping, um, you know, the shipping state if it's under $800, or otherwise we want to go into, let's call this VIP, special VIP state. Um, no, and because of that, this is not going to show anything, but that's just to, you know, to, um, demonstrates. Uh, so let's say that, oh yeah, so we add a condition. 
and we're saying that the context dot, um, all right, so we actually don't have the item in here, but let's say that we do have an item selected and we say the total cost is like $1,000. So if, we, if the context.cost is less than $800, we go to shipping. Otherwise, we go to VIP. So let's just add um, something over here. Let's add this heading back. Uh, this is going to be state.value. We're in cart. And now when we click checkout securely, it's going to, I have to reload. <laughs> Uh, it's going to take us to VIP. So not sure if that's what you mean, but um, yeah, that's just a demonstration of that. <clears throat> All right. So um, yeah, if you have any other questions, you know, please feel free to ask. Uh, we're getting short on time here. Going to, you know, end in about a few minutes, but I just wanted to show you just what, all of this looks like all together. So I have another code sandbox where um, you know we pretty much have a complete state machine. Um, so again, we have our checkout securely. You could choose an address, click one of these, continue to contact information. And then this is actually a good example of um, using that state.can. So we have this can continue variable. And if we go to it, we see that uh, we're checking if we can send the next event. And so this is really useful because um, this is checking like, hey, is there any transition? If I were to send this event, so this uh, type next event, is there any transition that is enabled um, when that event is sent? So what that means is, am I able to continue in this case, without sending an email, uh, without having a mobile number? And the answer is no, because in our state machine, um, if we scroll down here to contact information, we see that our condition is contact info valid, which we have over here. So we're requiring a, an email and a mobile. And because those uh, that condition is false, we know that we cannot continue on. So when we type something, oops, it's a wrong number. Now you see it becomes enabled. So if we dis or delete that, it becomes disabled and it becomes enabled again. So then we could continue to payment, uh, click these, mess up a little styling over here, uh, agree to the terms and conditions, place our order, and now we could confirm that the order has been placed. Um, and so this is the final state machine that we came up with. If I were to copy all of this and put it in the editor, um, hopefully this works. Let's go to my projects. And I'm going to create a new machine where I import that code. Um, so I'm just going to call this checkout. Uh, we failed to parse the machine definition. Uh, yeah, so something might be going on. Um, hmm. Okay, well, figure that out later. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's going to be our same machine. Actually, a better way to uh, show that is to just inspect it, um, but you're pretty much going to see the same stuff. Uh, answering a couple questions. Is CAN's value only related to conditions of a state? Um, yeah, so it's related to a couple things. CAN's value is related to um, basically, does there exist a transition uh, if I were to, you know, send that event over? Um, that that's basically what it's saying. So if I were to go back to our original machine over here, um, and let's say that we're on the contact you know, step over here. So if I just check out, go to contact, we could see that if I were to send the next event, there's no conditions or anything. Uh, so I could take that state.can is going to evaluate to true. However, if I have states.can and I add some bogus events like state.can um, 
order, like, you know, press the order button, um, then it's going to say, no, there is no transition from the state uh, that start or that transitions from the order event. So there's no possible way that that order event is going to do anything. So state.can is going to evaluate to false. And so that's basically how state machines operate under the hood, or at least the state machine state chart algorithm, where basically we receive an event and we see which events are enabled, sorry, which transitions are enabled based on that event. And so I think that answers this question too. Are there other factors that might be involved um, with CAN's value? So, yeah. Um, one more thing just for fun that I want to... Um, demonstrate is um, we talked about this briefly in the beginning, but you could also uh, represent tasks in states. So when I click the order button, um, actually, yeah. So when I click the order button, uh, this should go to, let's see, we don't even have that state, so confirmation. All right, let's run through this again. Check out securely, select this. Okay, I have an email. That's my actual number. Please don't call me. Um, place order. Now you're in the confirmation state. Um, but let's say that we wanted to model actually sending that order through. So instead of this confirmation step, we would go to some ordering step. So all this ordering. And now I actually want to invoke something. So this could be a fetch of some sort. In fact, let, let, let's make it a fetch. So the source of our invocation is going to be a, um, a promise. Um, but instead of, of fetch, just because I don't have an API off the top of my head, I'm just going to create a new promise. And we're going to set timeout. Um, and uh, this is going to resolve with just some data. Um, let, let's say that this is some order data, like an order number, an invoice number, something like that. And it's going to do it after, let's say, three seconds. And so just to prove that that's happening, I'm going to say console.log sending order. And so what do we do when that promise is done? Well, there is undone. And undone is the transition that occurs when the promise is done. There's also on error if you want. And uh, so that's a transition you could take when the promise rejects for some reason. But in this case, I'm just going to go to the confirmation state. You could also have actions that work on that data. So sign, let's say receipt. That's going to be event.data. And so that event.data is going to be that data over here. So let's just say invoice or invoice number one, two, three, four. That's what's going to be assigned to receipt. But we don't need to do that. Um, and so now I'm going to open the console just to make sure that we have that. Let's reload and see what happens. Uh, we're going to actually, I'm going to skip a few steps just to make sure our state machine works. Clicking pay via PayPal, agreeing to the terms and conditions. Placing the order, oops, all right, so just making sure my machine is correct. I might be using the wrong machine. Nope, I'm using the correct one, at least I think so. Oh, I'm using app.final, let's use app. Okay, going back to final, um, all right, so yeah. Uh, let me just bring this order over, or sorry, bring this over here. App checkout machine dot final. That should be okay. Sorry, just a little mix up with the files. Um, but now this should work. So let me reload, pay via PayPal, agree, place order. Two seconds and, or sorry, a few seconds, and then it goes to the confirmation screen. And you can see over here that we were sending our order. So, 
Um, and of course, if you were to model this over here and you know, we say, hey, we actually do need to model the fact that we're ordering something. Uh, this is what I really like about state machines in general and having a visual diagram to help us figure this logic out. We would say like, hey, uh, you know, we need some sort of ordering state. And in this ordering state, we're going to invoke a send order. So we could redirect this to go here, clean that up a little bit. And then we could go to the confirmation state when it's done. We could also model what happens if there's an error. So we could just, you know, move that over there. And, um, you know, this also makes it possible to have more complex logic. So for example, if you want to cancel, we could do something where, um, this is actually interesting. So if you're in the ordering state and you're invoking the send order, when you cancel, the, res uh, the results of that promise is going to be ignored. So, um, you know, you could do any sort of logic over here to, um, to handle that, like maybe send the server another event saying, hey, we're actually canceling that order, um, but it's not going to cause this transition to happen because the promise is being ignored. All right, so answering a few questions, if we use SSR, how can we use um, the state machine? And so you could, you could use it normally. So um, with SSR, which stands for server-side rendering, um, I, yeah, it, it really depends on your use case. SSR is a big umbrella, um, but you could definitely just start your state machine from a pre-populated starting state. Um, and of course you could use state machines on the server side as well. So again, um, it, it should work normally. It depends on your use case, but uh, please tell us in the discord how you plan on using state machines with SSR and we'll be able to help you there. Um, also, can we use XState instead of React Query for server state? Uh, you could use both XState and React Query. I like using, so React Query comes with a client. And so that client is really good for caching the results of, um, of async functions um, and using that so that you don't have to keep loading data over and over again. You could use that within an invoke. And also the standard pattern for how you would consume uh, I guess you could call it external data um, is like, let's say that we have um, const data from React query and it's just some data. So you can imagine that this data is actually um, from that, you know, use query hook, which we don't have over here, um, but you could just imagine that it's some sort of data. Uh, so the typical way that you would synchronize that data with XState is you would use effect. And then we would send that data from React Query whenever it changes. Or you, you wouldn't send this exactly. You would have to have an event. So type, let's just call it type received data. And then that data is that data from React Query. So whenever that changes, we're going to send an event to the state machine and notify it saying, hey, we received some data, do something with it. So that's the typical way that you would do that. Okay, answering other questions. Um, Stefan is digging up some old stuff. Uh, but yeah, so I would say a good way to close this out is to point you to a few examples uh, one of my favorites is over here, actually. This is the, um, this was made a while ago. Uh, it's the Cypress Real World app. And so this Cypress Real World app has a bunch of different um, pages. And uh, just to show you exactly what it looks like, you know, we have uh, forms and multi-step forms over here. Um, and just a lot of CRUD operations. And um, I guess it's sort of a banking or a payments app. Um, and so the purpose of this real world app is to demonstrate how you could use Cypress to test, um, you know, just test user interfaces. And uh, instead of creating dummy examples, they went the extra mile and created a real world app to demonstrate that. And so what's really interesting with this real world app is that there's also a bunch of state machines in here. So if I just search for a machine, 
We have a lot of them and um, yeah, you could look at them for inspiration. Uh, again, this is a real world app. So these are really good machines to learn from. Um, another fun one is this. So uh, I actually really like this one. It was made about 10 months ago. Uh, it's called X Snake. Get it? Like X dates, but with snakes. And you could clearly see the game logic over here. We start with a new game. And once you press the arrow key, you know, we're moving. And so this arrow key is going to just, uh, you know, change the direction. And there's also a, um, an always transition where if something happens, like if you eat an apple, we have some logic that happens. Or if you hit a wall, um, you know, game over. Uh, or if none of these apply, then you just keep on moving. And so it's really easy to describe the logic of the snake game just by looking at this date chart over here. And the results, of course, is this uh, this little game. So it's actually fun. It's not a snake. It's a baker making apple pies. And I'm actually terrible at this game. But um, yeah, you see when you hit a wall, I did that on purpose, I promise. Uh, you see that we have game over. And when we press R, it's going to transition us to that initial state where we could play again. So games are a really good way to experiment with X date and to model your games um, with that. Now, apart from that, we also have the registry and the registry contains a ton of machines uh, for you to discover. So these, a lot of these are made in stately viz. A lot of them are made within the editor itself. And um, yeah, so they're just really interesting machines. You could even sort them by um, you know, ones that are really big, like if they have a lot of, a lot of states. Um, let me see if we have any interesting machines to show. Uh, sometimes we actually um, just model uh, some features that we're working on, but you know, this is an example uh, where we're incrementing, you know, just yeah, so um, there's a lot of examples in here, uh, a lot of examples in our Discord and in the wild. And um, yeah, so uh, if anyone has any questions, we have a few minutes to answer them, um, and I'd be happy to. What are your thoughts, Jenny? <laughs> I think it's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm really excited for the hackathon in two days on Saturday. Oh so. yeah, that's right. Let me bring that up. Um, so for right those right. of you that are in Orlando and are attending the hackathon and you just are, uh, I'm losing my words. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you need more examples or if you are trying to get more prepared, um, feel free to check out our registry for examples or David, uh, if you could list those uh, examples that you showed us on the stream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll, I'll be sure to create a, a big list of them. Um, but yeah, if you are local to the Orlando area, we do have an Orlando um, devs and stately hackathon uh, that's happening in two days. And so this is going to be a nice hackathon where the goal is you're going to build something using state machines. It could be anything you want, whether it's a game, a back-end workflow, a front-end multi-step form like the checkout form that we created. Uh, if you want to go wild and do some sort of robotics thing, you could do that. So, like, There's just so many different things that you could use state machines for. Um, and so that's what we're going to be doing in the hackathon. Um, also animations, that's another really great one. Um, so yeah, uh, we're, we're also going to be sharing on social media all of the different things that people have created during the hackathon. And so we anticipate lots of really creative uh, solutions because the, the um, I guess the criteria is creativity. It's not your technical expertise. It's just how creative can you get? What kinds of things can you make with a state machine? Um, but yeah, with that said, thank you so much for joining us in our first um, first webinar, really. Uh, we are going to have more of these in the future. Please tell us what you like, what you don't like, what you would love to see, especially more examples. And uh, we'll definitely do that for you. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for joining.
Bye, everyone. Bye.